Uh, thanks for coming to my panel. Honestly, this is something I'm really excited to be doing, uh, and I hope you get something out of it as well. Uh, let's do a quick introduction uh, as we get started to the panel. It's called like nobody's watching, but you knew that already because you're already here. Cool. Uh, let's get to know me. Who do you think you are? The question on everybody's lips right now. Uh, and the short and sweet answer is I'm just this guy. I'm not anyone special. I'm not famous. Uh, I'm just a dude who likes making things. And I suspect if you're in this room, you also like making things, which is why you came to this. And so I'm excited about that. Thank you. Uh, we probably have that in common. Another important question, why am I up here? Uh, this short answer is I submitted a panel and it got accepted. Uh, if you learn nothing else about PAX, it's that anyone can submit a panel. And theoretically, anyone can get accepted, because I did. Uh, someone thought it was a cool idea, and so they brought me up here. So thank you, again, for whoever made that decision. Uh, I don't have any connections in the industry. Uh, I am not famous. I don't know anybody famous. Uh, my lamest claim to fame is that uh, I once sold one of the brothers from Supernatural a printer, and no, I won't tell you which one. <laughs> uh, but the key thing, the real reason that I, I got up here and I submitted a panel is because I wasn't afraid of failure. Uh, I did it because I thought I could, and somebody else did too. And I want you to take away from that. Like, failure is not the end state here, and we'll talk about that a little bit more on. Uh, but that's all it was. Uh, what have I done? Uh, again, nothing you've probably heard of, which is by design. Uh, but I'm going to list out some things. I'm going to kind of run through these. Uh, you've not heard of any of them, so I'm not listing them by name. Uh, I have written and drawn two different web comics. Uh, I have hosted three different podcasts. I've made 85 YouTube videos. Uh, that number shocked me when I looked it up, uh, especially considering I haven't made any in like 10 years. Uh, I have written three different blogs on various topics. I wrote a newspaper column for my college newspaper, probably the closest I ever got to famous, because uh, it ended up with me getting death threats. So I figured that's a certain amount of uh, a, a death threat. A lot of people hated me. One person threatened to kill me. It's fine. Uh, I wrote a video game. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to make a video game. There's a lot of tools out there. I encourage you to try it. Uh, Twine is super easy uh, to start using, as well as things like RPG Maker or Visual Novel Maker. Uh, give it a shot, you can do it. Literally nothing is stopping you. Uh, I've been a Twitch streamer. I Twitch stream pretty consistently for about six months. Nobody watched. Perfect. Uh, I wrote a bunch of play scripts. Once upon a time, I was a playwright. Uh, technically, I still am. I'm just not writing anything right now. Uh, I have two different novelty Twitter accounts. No, I'm not going to tell you what they are. <laughs> I have cosplayed exactly once at this very convention, PAX South 2015. You may have taken a picture with me. Uh, I write a newsletter every week. This is my only current ongoing project. Uh, I do a weekly newsletter on pop culture and random thoughts in my head, as well as the things that I own, because I thought that was an interesting perspective. Uh, I own lots of things, and I have stories about them. Uh, I have four unusual interpretations of songs in karaoke. Uh, I've been told that my Hit Me Baby One More Time is terrifying. <laughs> so, there's that. Uh, I've also taken a nearly infinite number of cat photos, mostly photos of my cat. There's my cat. That's uh, she's going to show up a few times because I use her to, take, to fill up space. Uh, Felicity is her name, someone asked. Uh, I've been making things on the internet for close to 20 years. Uh, I did the math recently, and again, you've not heard of me, and I love that. Uh, some deeper dives on those, a couple of these things, I want to talk about them uh, specifically and how they fail, because I think it's interesting. Uh, here's another cat photo while I talk about myself. Uh, I've been making things, not just on the internet, but just in my life for as long as I can remember. Uh, I wrote my first book in third grade. It was a little, very short book, but I wrote it. I drew pictures in it. Uh, I wrote my first comic in middle school. Uh, I didn't even know the internet existed at that point in time. Uh, I wrote my first web comic on AOL online message boards. Uh, using MS Paint. Uh, thankfully, those are lost to the sands of time. I know because I haven't checked. Uh, something that was not lost to the sands of time was my second webcomic. Here's a picture of it. I'm going to put it up very briefly. Look closely. It's garbage. It's garbage. That still exists on the internet. You can find it. I know because I did to go find that image. Uh, everything exists on the internet forever, uh, but not in America Online. Uh, I've made YouTube videos. There's me eating a bowl of chili. Uh, this was technically a reference to Andy Warhol eating a cheeseburger, which is an actually good piece of art. Mine isn't, but I'm okay with that. Uh, I've also, as I said, hosted three different podcasts. These, again, like everything else on the internet, still exist. Uh, one of those might actually be interesting to people in the room. Catastrophic is an RPG podcast where we play the game Fiasco. Uh, the rest of them are bad. Ignore them. Uh, but all of these things, the key thing is all of these things have failed and I have quit doing them. 
Those are not the same thing, and I want to be really clear about that. These things were always doomed to failure. Everything I create is always doomed to failure because that's how the internet works. But I didn't quit because they were doomed to failure. I made them, they exist, and because they're on the internet, they exist forever. And that's really exciting to me. Uh, I want to talk a little bit as we go forward what it means to be a failure and how exactly to be a failure. Like, what does it take? How do you get up to here and be a failure like me? Uh, but before I talk specifically about how to be a failure, I want to talk about something related, and I hope this gets back into alignment in a minute. Um, it's something called the friendship paradox. Uh, you may have heard of this. Uh, I've read, listened to it on podcasts. It's shown up a few times. Uh, but the core part of the friendship paradox is a bet that I could make with every single person in this room. And if I did that, I would come out ahead 100% of the time. I would make more money than I lost by making this bet. And that bet is I could go up to any one of you and I could say, I bet you that your friends have more friends than you, on average. If I went up to any one of you and we counted up all of the number of friends that you have, and then we averaged the number of friends that all of those people had, you would not have as many friends as your friends. And that's an interesting thing, I'm not getting into the maths of it, look it up later, it's, it is fascinating, it's just the way like social networks in general work. Um, but I found another way, as I was thinking about this, another way to talk about this that might make more sense to you, might make things a little bit more obvious, and that is, the people you follow on YouTube have more followers than you. Not just on YouTube, just in life. The people you follow on YouTube are more famous than you. That probably isn't surprising, because you're in this panel, you're not famous. <laughs> uh, but no, but it's the same math, it's the same thing behind it, it's the same thing that is true. And statistically speaking, that will always be true. Even if you become famous on YouTube, on average, the people you follow on YouTube will be more famous than you. Uh, that's, again, just the way networks work. It's vastly over-emphasized uh, in YouTube as opposed to as being a friendship, uh, being friends. Uh, speaking of uh, people being famous, uh, I should mention Randall Monroe's uh, comic about uh, disclaimers about survivorship bias. Consider this my disclaimer about survivorship bias. I'm up here, you're not. I am still a failure, though. We have that in common. I'll give you a second to read it. It's funny. So, I've survived, the people you've seen on YouTube have survived, they have become famous, and they are famous because they've become famous. Uh, I should say, though, that that's not the majority of people making the, things on the internet. Most people who are making things on the internet are not famous. And it's, it's good company, it's a great place to be there. Uh, I should mention as part of this, uh, I'm terrified to be up here right now. I want that to be very clear. I seem like I'm easy going, but I am terrified. I've been working on this for six months, and the entire time I've been working on this, I've had to continue to tell myself, it's okay to fail. And that's literally the topic of my, my, my panel, is it's okay to fail. It's hard to internalize. It's hard to remember when we're doing these sorts of things because we only see the winners. We only see the people who have survived, who have been successful. But look at this room. This is a room full of people who are not famous on the internet and are all making cool things. And that's really exciting. So good job, y'all. I'm happy for you. So I said we're going to talk about how not to be famous. Uh, there's two ways to do that, uh, the easy way and the hard way. Uh, the easy way to not get famous uh, is to do nothing. Congrats, you've already done it. That's the easy way. Um, we've already done it, we've succeeded, we can go home. Now the second way is a little bit harder. Uh, the second way is to do something, to make something, to do something over and over and over again, to continually put things out there for let's say 20 years and never get noticed by anybody. Uh, that's hard because, A, it's, it's hard to make stuff. Making things takes effort and takes time and is valuable. But also, there's always that chance you might get famous. <laughs> and then you've, you've failed. You've failed on not on failing. Uh, so someone might retweet something you made and then you become famous and then it's this whole big thing you gotta deal with. Um, so I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about what success is and what failure is. I was in six words like, hey, you're being famous, you're being successful. I've called myself a failure multiple times up here because I am. But what, what does it mean to be successful? You've probably heard people say this, oh, say, success is not fame, fame is not success. Uh, and, and success is how you define it. And that's all true. Uh, you know, success is how you define it, but that's also true of any word. Uh, for some people, success is, not, is being famous. For some people, being successful is being able to support a family or being able to support themselves or just be alive in the world. It's all it takes to be successful sometimes. Uh, but I, always, I put this up here specifically because like saying you have to define success uh, is useless and meaningless. Uh, you have to define every word. I could just as easily say a tomato is not a vegetable. 
And, well, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. The Supreme Court says it is for taxing purposes, and biologist <laughs> says that it's not because of biology. It doesn't actually matter, because I don't want one on my sandwich. Like, that's what it comes down to. Um, so, yes, we have to define success. I'm not going to do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the common definition of success. I'm going to talk about success in terms of being famous, making money, and being a failure is not doing those things, because that's what everybody else uses those terms as. So I'm not here to give you platitudes and say that you will be successful because you'll change the definition of what success means. No, you're gonna be a failure. Uh, but that's a good thing. There is joy in failure. Uh, failure is, is one of my absolute favorite things. So let's talk about juggling. Does anyone here juggle? I knew there were some of you. A bunch of nerds in a room. Uh, I also juggle occasionally. Uh, and there's one, there's, there's a first rule of juggling that I learned. I learned how to juggle from a book. Uh, that was my, my way of juggling. Uh, and the first rule of juggling is don't juggle. It doesn't make you more attractive. <laughs> um, the second first rule of juggling, uh, which I learned in this book, was you take the balls, you hold them out in front of you, uh, three or four or ten, however many balls you're trying to learn how to juggle, and you drop them. And then you pick them up, and you go find the one that rolled under the couch, and you pick them up, and you hold them out in front of you again, and you drop them. And you do this over and over and over again. I didn't throw my first ball until I'd been practicing juggling for what felt like a week. Because in juggling, you're going to drop the balls. It is an inevitable part of the process. You are fighting gravity and gravity is stronger than you are. It's going to happen. Once you've accepted that, once you've internalized it, and once you've done it a bunch, it's not a big deal anymore. It's part of the process. It's an inevitable part of the process. So it's okay to suck. I just want to say that. I just want to put that out there. It's okay to suck. It's okay to fail. Um, or as a, a TV show that's much better than I am and much more successful than I am put it, uh, sucking at something is the first step towards being sort of good at something. Uh, and all I ever want to be is sort of good at something. I'm not going to be a success, and that's okay. So what happens when you suck? You know, if you said sucking is okay, but what are the consequences of that? What happens when you suck? Well, a few things can happen. Uh, people might laugh at you. People might point and laugh at you. That's also likely. Uh, but more often than not, people are going to ignore you. Uh, I know that because I've been doing it for a long time. I've been sucking for a long time, and most people have ignored it. And that's the best option of the three, I think. Uh, being ignored means I don't develop an audience, which means nobody sees me fail which means I'm free to fail in all sorts of new and exciting ways. And I love that. Let me say that again. Not having an audience means you're free to fail. When there's nobody to disappoint, you can be disappointing as long as you want. That might sound a little nihilistic, a little existential or depressing, but I think it's a joyous nihilism. Nihilism says, nothing matters, deal with it. But the deal with it part of that is the exciting part. Nothing matters. We can do what we want. We can continue to fail. Woo! <laughs> You've probably heard the story that Thomas Edison made 200 ways to invent a light bulb. You've heard that nods. Uh, I don't know if it's true. I don't care if it's true. Uh, if it is true, that's amazing. Because I cannot even imagine 200 ways to not make a light bulb. <laughs> light bulbs work very simply. You have a filament. You put electricity through it, it gets hot and bright. <laughs> I mean, I know that because Thomas Edison invented it, or someone else invented it, I don't know. But I know that. But I can't think of 200 ways to fail to do that. And if I ever went to the Thomas Edison Museum, the first thing I would look for is the room full of failed light bulbs. Failed light bulbs sound fascinating to me. And that's not just true of light bulbs, but lots of things that are failures are fascinating. Some of my favorite YouTube videos out there have less than 100 views and are absolutely terrifying and confusing and I do not know how they came to exist on the internet. <laughs> and I love every single one of them. You know, you watch bad movies, watch bad movies for fun, make fun of them with your friends and family. Again, real full of art, it's gonna happen. Uh, bad movies kind of fall into two categories for me. Uh, there are the sort of, we're making a bad movie stuff that like The Asylum puts out. If you've ever seen The Asylum, Sharknado is the sort of ex obvious example of all of those. Um, Sharknado is a bad movie that I don't enjoy because they're trying to be bad. And when you're trying to be bad, you are not going to surprise me. You're going to make the same mistakes that everybody else is trying to be bad is going to do, and it's going to be boring. 
I find the same problem exists in really good movies, a lot of really good movies. Like any movie that's won an Oscar that was a historical epic that was a love story set in front of the backdrop of an important historic conflict of some sort and there's a parallel between the two. I've seen that movie a hundred times and it's always the exact same. And it's a great movie and people love it, but it's boring. Terrible movies that people make with love and with joy in their hearts. The Room is a great example of a terrible movie. It's a little overplayed. But it's a movie that was made by someone who believed 100% in what he was doing, and you never know what's going to happen next, because he has no idea what he's doing, and he is failing beautifully. <laughs> and I love that. Uh, not every bad movie is good, but the best bad movies are amazing, because there's surprise, and there's the unexpected, and there's joy in that experience of discovering it. Uh, speaking of bad movies, I want to mention two great things out there if you love bad movies or want to learn more about how to love bad movies. Uh, there's a YouTube channel called Film Joy run by Mikey Newman, uh, someone much more famous than I am, so you've probably already heard of him. Uh, he does a series called uh, Deep Dives, where they watch bad movies and find things to love about them, and they're, it's amazing. There's also a, a columnist named, na named Nathan Rabin. Uh, he does a series called My World of Flops, where he watches movies that have flopped, uh, or other things that have flopped, booked, things like that, big announcements that did terribly, um, and he loves them. He finds ways to love them, so check those out if you want. But the key takeaway here is, Failure can be surprising. Failure can do things that you never expected it was going to do. And the best failures surprise you in the best possible ways. But something else is also true about failure, is that failure is risky. There's an inherent risk in failure. Look at this convention. PAX South 2019. PAX has been here now for five years. PAX South has been here for five years. PAX itself has been going for over a decade. By all accounts, it's a resounding success. Thousands of people come here every year. Thousands of people contribute to that success. We've got people in this room who are working very hard to make sure that this does not fail. And what if it did fail? Like, what happens? What does that look like? I don't know. If it fails, well, first of all, we wouldn't be here. We'd stop coming to Max, and that would be disappointing. Uh, but people might lose their jobs. People might lose their vocations. People might lose a space where they call home. Like, this is, like, that's my favorite PAX banner you've seen, Welcome Home. Like, this is a place that is comforting for a lot of people. And there's a risk of failure there. And so all those people that are working very hard to keep PAX successful are doing so because PAX can't fail at this point. The risk is too great. I mean, PAX could fail. It's always a possibility, but nobody wants it to. However, what happens if I, someone who's been consistently failing for my entire life, continues to fail? Nothing. I mitigate the risk by doing it all the time. You know, sell it in bulk and make up it on, va on volume. <laughs> I don't have an audience to disappoint. If this panel collapses, falls apart, and burns to the ground in front of me, that's cool, I'll move on. We'll be all right, I mean, except for the burning part. <laughs> uh, I don't have an audience to disappoint. I can't disappoint anyone by failing. Well, except my mother, but I have two degrees in theaters, so that ship has sailed. <laughs> uh, if I gain an audience, I gain risk along with that. I lose the opportunity to continue to fail, and to fail in new and exciting and interesting ways. Uh, when I make something, like those things I listed before, and I decide I don't want to make them anymore, I stop. I walk away. I can, and I have that ability to do so. That's not always true when you're famous and when you're successful, and the thing that you have made is the thing you have to keep making because it's paying your bills, because it's feeding your family. Uh, there are probably YouTubers out there, I can't speak of them specifically because I don't know them and I'll talk about that too, but there are YouTubers out there, there are Twitch streamers out there, there are creators out there who probably want to stop. They probably want to walk away, but their creative activity that they started for fun as a hobby because they were free to fail in the beginning, because we all are, lost that freedom when it became their livelihood. Uh, I can promise you there are YouTubers out there, there are creators out there, there are people writing out there who want to switch to something entirely different, but there's a risk there that they can't take because it might not be that their audience wants to follow them on that channel. People might not want to continue backing their Patreon, buying their products. And that sounds miserable. It does. And like I want to say, well, yeah, go do whatever you want, but also like it's a job. You got to do your job. I want to take another digression and talk about parasocial relationships. Talking about once YouTube becomes your job or once being a creator becomes your job. 
I'm not speaking here from experience, I'm speaking here um, as an audience member, um, so I want you to think about this as an audience member as well. Um, you may have heard of parasocial relationships, you may not, this may be the first one you've ever heard of them. Uh, again, somebody else who does much better work than I am, goes really in depth into this, is uh, Shannon Scrucci. She's got a YouTube series called Fake Friends. Check it out. Uh, the second episode's like an hour and a half long and terrifying. Uh, so she goes way more in depth than I'm going to be able to. But the short version of a parasocial relationship is whether we want to or not, our brains trick us into thinking that we are friends and that we know the people that we follow on social media, the people we watch on YouTube, the Twitch streamers that we follow. We think we know them because we see so much of their lives. And normally when you see that much of somebody's lives, it's because you're friends with them. It's because you are a part of their life and they are a part of your life. Uh, we see their ups and downs. We see when they're having you know, a great time. We see when they're having a bad time, if they let us. They don't always let us. We don't always know. A lot of people hide those sorts of things because again, there's that risk in that failure and they maybe aren't able to take that risk of being open. But we get tricked by our own brains into thinking that we have a relationship with these people, that we know something, anything about their lives. But parasocial relationships really are inherently one directional. <laughs> That's my joke. Um. It's a good joke, I'm gonna let you know. Uh, but One Direction is, I mean, I'm using them as a joke here, but it's also an, an amazing example of parasocial relationships. I will say, I don't know anything about One Direction. I have no opinions whatsoever about One Direction. They're clearly successful. They're doing something right. I'm sure they're nice guys, except for the one that quit because we don't like him now. I don't know. Um, but there's this unfair stereotype about, like, boy bands in general. Um, and particularly the stereotype about the fans of boy bands. And it's this idea that they are these sorts of people that just, that, that like, people fall in love with typically women, which is also a problem. Uh, people fall in love with these people, they go around screaming. But we also, if you think back, like the Beatles were a boy band and they had the exact same thing. Like that's Beatles in prime boy band time. Uh, but these people, these, these fans of these groups are, we see them as like, oh, they're being obsessed or oh, they're falling in love with these people. Um, and it's always an extreme example. They put up their posters, and they scream their name, and they send them letters. But we all do this. We all have these creators that we have this parasocial relationship with you. And if you don't think you do, I dare you to double check. Uh, a celebrity couple broke up a few months ago. I won't say who. Uh, and I was devastated and shocked and surprised, and I didn't know why. These were not people I've ever met, but they're people I were following. I've been following for a long time. And I was like, why am I mad about this? And it's because I had attached myself. I had made this discovery, and we do it all the time. We think we do it. And in the age of social media, where I can follow someone on YouTube, and Twitch, and Twitter, and Facebook, and Instagram, and be near them all the time digitally, they've got the opposite problem. They've got a million people who think that they are near them but aren't. They're fans. There's a distance. There's a separation there. And that sounds overwhelming and a little bit terrifying. I, I did mention I got a death threat once because of a newspaper column I wrote. Um, that was terrifying because of the death threat. But also this sort of realization that like people had strong opinions about me that I had never met. And I don't know that I could deal with that if I became famous. I am incredibly sympathetic to that pressure and what it can put on a person. It's potentially unbearable. Like I get why people quit social media and move away from it. And it's not just because people are mean to them on the internet. Sometimes it's because people are too nice on the internet. People get smothered with this love from strangers that is not real because those strangers are just that. They don't know who I am if I'm a famous person, I'm not. They don't know who I am. They don't know what I'm going through. They only see this lens that I put up in front of the world. I couldn't deal with that. I don't think I could. Um, so if I ever do become famous, I'm gonna quit all the social medias. You'll never find me again. But it's not a problem. Um, and when you don't have an audience, that's not a problem. You're free to change your mind, to fail, to have your ups, to have your downs, to live on the internet without putting up a wall around you at all the time. Uh, so I encourage you, just as a, as a like PSA moment, 
Uh, think about the, the people that you're a fan of and evaluate your emotional connection to them. You may be fine, you may be perfectly healthy, you may be like, yes, I have an appropriate amount of respectful distance between them. But then also think about like, how you feel next time you go to an autograph signing or next time you know, they like something that you like and you discover it together. What does that connection mean? What is going on in your brain? Uh, I can't tell you, but think about it. Things cost money. This is probably not a surprise. It has been this way for a long time. I do not see it changing anytime soon. So you need money to do things. We've already established this is a room full of failures. We're not gonna be successful. We're not gonna be making money on our creative pursuits. So you gotta think about how am I spending this money? And you gotta ask how much money do things cost? The things that I'm trying to create, what is the value of them? Start thinking about them instead of something that might in 10 years make you money and make your, become your profession. Think about it as a hobby instead and budget for your hobby. You spend a certain amount on video games or on board games every month or every year. You spend a certain amount on your Netflix account. And that's, if you're making a budget, that's part of your budget. You're thinking about these things. These are your hobbies, the things you're excited about. When you make creativity your hobby, you can start budgeting for it. The good news is lots of creative work is free. You can do lots of creative things for very little or very zero money. Um, and you can just start doing it. A couple of those things, drawing, pick up a pen, go steal a pen from a bank. <laughs> you have a pen, you can now start drawing. Depends, do banks still give out pens? Like, I don't know. They train it down, that's a joke. Hotels, hotels have lots of pens. Steal all the hotel pens and you can start drawing. <laughs> you don't really even need something to draw on because there's things all around you and you can draw on those. Um, don't graffiti, don't break the law, it's in the rules of packs. do it at home. Uh, you can sing, you can sing for free. I sing for free all the time, usually in the comfort of my home, occasionally at the karaoke bar, uh, but again, terrifying. <laughs> you can write, you can create, you can do all of these things with stuff you probably already have. You can start making YouTube videos with a smartphone that's probably in your pocket right now, and you can post them on YouTube for free. Again, any service you use is using you, especially if it's free, so keep that in mind. Be aware of the actual costs behind them. So it's a sort of a free thing. But even as we're building these things, as we're putting things out on the internet, we're using other people's platforms for, again, quote unquote free, there are things that aren't free, and there's things, those are the things we have to start thinking about budgeting. Some things that aren't free, uh, web hosting. If you want to have your own space, you need to figure out what am I willing to spend on web hosting? Who's out there? Can I do it myself? Can I pay someone to do it for me? Domain names cost money. I own a few. They cost money. I pay that every year. Advertising. Now again, we're not trying to build an audience. Uh, we're not trying to become famous in this room. I still advertise my stuff because I think it's fun. I, I like spending 10 bucks on Reddit ads in weird subreddits and say, look at this thing I made. And then people get mad. They're like, what are you selling? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, but more importantly, time. Time is not free. We don't think about time as having a value or a cost, but it does. Uh, so I want to kind of break down like a week and think about a budget in your time. Uh, so there are 168 hours in a week. Don't check my math on that. You might spend 40 of them working. If you've got a nine to five job, you're working 40 hours a week. You might spend more, you might spend less. These are all approximations. You might spend 56 hours a week sleeping. I try to spend that much a week sleeping. You might spend 20 hours a week doing the stuff you gotta do. Getting groceries, running errands, going to the doctor, whatever. We all got stuff we gotta do and it takes up a lot of time and nobody likes it. You might spend 10 hours a week with your friends and loved ones. Maybe more, hopefully more, but I budgeted 10. Uh, you might spend 10 hours traveling from A to B. Just getting from place to place takes time. You're commute, you're getting to the store, you're getting to your friends, to spend time with them. That all takes time. You might spend 20 hours a week on entertainment. I bumped this to 20 because I figured this group does. <laughs> uh, good, group of nerds. Uh, so what's left? So we add all that up. If you've done the math already, you already know the answer, but what's left with all of that? What do we have after I've done all the things I gotta do, I've just lived my life, I have 12 hours a week left. That number may surprise you, it surprised me. That was an actual breakdown that I did of my life in a week, and I was like, oh, this is all the stuff I gotta do. Uh, if you've read the work of Malcolm Gladwell, uh, you've probably heard of the 10,000 hours, the mythical 10,000 hours you have to hit to be a, a guru or an amazing person at something like that. Uh, if you spend 12 hours a week for, until you hit that 10,000 hour mark, you're gonna spend about 17 years becoming amazing at something. They could spend 40 hours a week and get there faster, but we're spending 12, that's what we got. Good luck, I wish you the best. I don't have 17 years to spend on stuff. I've made so many more interesting things. 
But we don't want to be great at something. We don't want to be a virtuoso. We don't want to be the best at something. We just want to be mediocre at something. And with 12 hours a week, I can be mediocre at lots of things. <laughs> I'll take that same 12 hours a week and pick one thing a month to try out and try and become mediocre at. So four weeks, 12 hours a week, that same 17 years that you could have used to get to your 10,000 mythical hours in the sciences out on that still too, that's Malcolm Gladwell for you. But with that same 12 hours a week, one new thing a month, you could become mediocre at 200 things. Click <laughs> over. 200 things. That's a lot of things to be mediocre. That's 200 new ways to make a light bulb. I can't come up with that many things to be mediocre at. But it'd be cool to find out. It'd be cool to find what are those things that I've never tried before. I picked up knitting. That's a thing I've never done before. I picked up oil painting. That's a thing I've never done before. And in 12 hours a week for a month, you can do a lot of mediocre watercolors. I encourage you to try it. Uh, but you do need an actual budget too. So that's budgeting your time. Think about what you can do with your 12 hours a week or however much time you have. If you have more, great. If you have less, that's okay too. Do what you can with it. But you need an actual budget. You need to figure out what your money costs. We're treating being creative as a hobby. We're treating it as something that you're spending money on. And I do not have infinity money. I suspect you might not have infinity money either. So you want to think about how you're spending your money. You want to think about what does it cost me to be creative on the internet? What does it cost me to make these things I make? I don't know how much money you have. I know how many hours you have in a week, because that's the same for all of us. Uh, so I'm not going to give you a like, total breakdown of everything you can theoretically spend with your own money. Do that. Do that if you're not creative on the internet. Just have a budget. It's better for you. Uh, but here's an example of something that I spend on one thing. So I have a podcast, I mentioned. Um, and that podcast still exists. I'm not making new episodes for it right now. I've walked away from it. I might come back one day. Uh, but this is why I pay for that. So I pay $50 annually for a domain. The domain is catastrophic.horse. <laughs> why dot horse? Because you can buy a dot horse domain. That's why. <laughs> you, dot coms are for losers. <laughs> buy a dot horse. Buy a dot pizza. I don't know if that one's real or not. It should be. Uh, so I pay 50 bucks a month for that domain. Um, and I'm going to pay that forever. I pay five bucks a month for hosting. I use a service called Pinecast. You can do it for free if you do your, or cheaper. Nothing's free. You're for cheaper using like AWS or your own web hosting. That's what I pay for my podcast. I use free software to record and edit. It's something called Audacity. It's open, not open source. It used to be open source. It's free. Uh, I have a $100 microphone that we all sit around and record. It's not the best audio setup. We're just sitting at a table in omnidirectional mode. But that's money I spent. And that's money I'm going to continue to spend, particularly on those annually or monthly costs. I'm going to spend that forever, as long as I can, basically, until I decide to not spend that anymore and the thing will go away. Because as even though we say everything's on the internet forever, sometimes it's not. If I stop paying for my domain, if I stop paying for my uh, web hosting, it's gone. Like, I still own the files, I still have them, but nobody else can access it. So when you make being creative a hobby, it's not a source of income. It's a source of outcome. <laughs> Don't think about it too hard. Uh, so it's important to think about it like you're budgeting for a hobby. Because again, things cost money. I can't tell you how to spend your money. I can't tell you what to do with your money. I certainly can't tell you how to make money being creative on the internet, because I have no idea. <laughs> but keep in mind, making things can cost money. Uh, and when things cost money, they have value. Which brings me to part four, fudge you pay me. <laughs> I had to replace the original word there because this is not a 13 and over panel. Uh, so here's something you've probably heard before. Creativity is its own reward. You might have heard this from people like me who encourage you to make things and tell you to go out there and you won't be successful, and that's important. You're never going to make any money, but creativity is its own reward. Stop. Wait. No. Wrong. Creativity is its own reward for you. Creativity is not the reward for other people. For other people, money is the reward for you being creative. If someone wants you to be creative, they get to give you money. Let's say the inevitable happens. Your work gets noticed by somebody. They like it. They want you to make a thing. That's exciting. We're all failures, so somebody liking my thing is a big deal. I'm excited. And they say, would you make thing for me? And I'd say, yes, I'd love to make thing for you. <laughs> and the next words out of your mouth should be, thing costs this much money. Practice it. Practice it in the mirror. Practice it. It's, it might happen. You won't ever be famous, but someone might like your thing and ask you to make another one. 
People who want to take advantage of you often say creativity is its own reward. Make a thing for me. Creativity is its own reward. You like making things, so make me thing. There's an exception to that, which is gifts. We give gifts of value. We give gifts to our friends. I often make things for friends. But that thing has value, which is why I'm giving it as a gift. If the things I made had zero value, if they weren't worth anything monetarily or time or just emotional labor, that would be a really crappy gift. <laughs> Gifts should have value. And the things I make have value. I give them to people freely because they have value. People don't get to ask that of you. People don't get to ask for a gift. Now, occasionally people will just come up and say, can I have things for free? And you will say no, and then things will move on. But occasionally people will try and trick you into giving them giving you things for free. There's a few different ways you can be taken advantage of as an artist, of a, as a creative person. Uh, the most common one is something called spec work or speculative work. You may have heard of this before. Super basic version of spec work is someone says, uh, make thing for me and if I like it, I will give you money. Um, which is a real good way for them to not give you any money for the labor that you've put into making a thing. Because then they can just say, no, I don't like it, but they have it anyway. It's theirs. This is something corporate work does a lot, particularly in the creative fields. They'll say, hey, make us a poster for our product or make us a booklet. And if we like it, we'll give you money. That's not how that works. You have value. The work you create has value. Get value for it. Um, something else is sort of a secondary category of art content, of spec work is art contests. Um, there's a bunch of these out there. There's a website called 99designs.com. Never use it. Never go on there and be a creator. Basically, 99 Designs allows a company, a person, anybody to say, I need a new logo, for example, for my product or for my company. And then you hold a contest and everybody can submit, anybody can submit work and a version of the logo that you think you would, that they think you would like. And the winner gets 50 bucks or a pizza or whatever. But they've just gotten the labor and the value of a hundred people and paid for one. And that is super exploitative. Do not do it. Nospec.com, check it out. Uh, it's another reference, nospec.com. Uh, the other thing is for exposure. Uh, this happens a lot. I see this particularly on the lower end of the creative environment, like someone who's got a little bit of fame, like, I've got 10,000 followers on YouTube, or I've got 1,000 followers on Twitch. And they'll say, I'll shout out your work if you make me a logo. And you say, cool, I would appreciate that. This is the price. This is how much money it costs. This has value. If somebody else sees the value in, you, in what you create to the point that they want it, that's because they've already admitted it has value to them. They're asking for it. They want the thing because they like the thing because it has value. It then becomes your job to ask for that value. And if they won't give it to them, that's fine, move on. We're not trying to make money. We're not trying to be a famous person or a successful person who's making a living off of our art. But that does not mean that your work does not have value. Ask yourself, how much time did it take me to make this? Or would it take me to make that? And then pay yourself you know, at least twice minimum wage. Ask yourself, what are the material costs for that? Put some overhead on it because things go over budget. Ask yourself, how much creative willpower am I going to spend on this creative thing? And put a number on it. Figure out what that number is to you. Because every time you're making something for somebody else, that's something you're not making for yourself. And we've all got a really limited amount of time. We've maybe got 12 hours a week. We might have less. And we don't know how many weeks we got left. Put, work, put value on your work. I'm going to say it again. Your work has value. Your art has value. Your time has value. Value your time. And you have value as an artist. Remember it. Take ownership of it. Even if you're a failure, especially if you're a failure, you have value and put value in the things that you make. Sometimes that's money, sometimes it's not. But if you, you need to make that decision early and often. Cool, we're about time for my conclusion. Yay, conclusion. Uh, D&D players, other, other hand raise? Yeah, of course. Lots of D&D players. Uh, there's a class in Dungeons and Dragons called The Bard. Um, you already know this. But for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, uh, The Bard is a really interesting class, and I love, I love Bards as a class. Bards have an ability called Jack of All Trades. 
when you're a bard and you have the ability to jack of all trades, you are a little bit better at everything than someone who has exactly zero training in it. And that's amazing. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm not, I don't have training. I'm not good at anything, but I'm a little bit better than someone who has exactly zero training. Be a bard. Go out there and be a bard. Be a little bit better at a bunch of things that no one else has done. Uh, that being said, I've also been lying to you this entire time. I'm actually Banksy. <laughs> um, I'm, that would be weird, though, if I was Banksy. Uh, no, no, uh, I'm, not, I'm not Banksy. I'm not famous. That is all true. Uh, that's not the lie. Uh, what I've been lying to you about is uh, I've been telling you, like, you're never going to be famous. You're never going to be successful. And there's been a hidden lie in that, which is that nobody's ever going to see your work. And that is not true. That is a lie. People will see the things you make. Sorry, I get choked up at these things. People will make, you will make things and people will see it. People will experience it. Those YouTube videos with 100 views have 100 views. That's 100 people who have seen a thing that never existed before. My newsletter that I write, 17 subscribers. I know every single one of them. But they see it every single week. And they experience it. And they experience something that I created. Easiest magic trick in the world, or not easiest, but the first magic trick in the world that magicians always do is they pull a rabbit out of a hat. The core of that magic trick is making something appear where nothing appeared before. You can do that. Might not be a rabbit, might not be a hat. But you can make a thing that never existed before in the entire universe, and then other people will see that thing. Again, back to being a bard. Bards are better than at everything, but they're not good at anything. Bards also have magic. They're not wizards, they're not sorcerers, they're not casting spells all day long. But bards can do real basic magic tricks. You can do a real basic magic trick, but it's still magic. It's still magic in a world where magic doesn't really exist most of the time. But you have the power, be it in art or YouTube or a Twitch stream or a dumb joke you tell on a novelty Twitter account to make something that never existed before, and that is magic. I'm going to end with a Q&A, but thank you. I'm going to say one last thing to wrap up. Uh, so we're going to open the floor for Q&A. Um, my request is if you ask me a question, I get to ask you a question. And that question is, what's something cool you've made? <laughs> and if you don't have a question, you can just come to tell me something cool you've made too, because uh, I think that's cool. But feel free to also ask me questions. Hello, my Hello. name is Jose. Um, I've never been up and uh, to ask a question, so Congrats. forgive me, everybody. You did something you've never done before. That's yeah. exciting. Thank you. And this is the best place to fail at if you fail. Yeah, thank you. I feel comfortable. Um, I was going to say, though, um, to your point that uh, it's easier to fail if nobody's watching you, um, I really came to that because I've been making music for a couple of months now. Um, I produce stuff and just like put it on SoundCloud. That's I don't really think people are gonna um, listen to it or anything, but I do it just because it's cool. Um, but I've noticed that if I if I have made a song and then go back to it a couple of months and listen to it, I feel like it's more it's better creatively to listen to something that you've made with no other input from anybody else. Um, so for example, like, um, yeah, like a couple of days ago, I listened to the first song that I've ever put out. Mm -hmm. And it was, I could see, oh, I did this wrong, I did mm -hmm. this wrong, I did, I could have done this. Um, that would have been way different if I had my mom or my sure. best friends like coming up to me saying, oh, I like this about it, or you could have done this or that. It, would have had, it wouldn't have come from me, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, and I feel like my first song, I guess, in a lot of ways, it was a failure, but I know it's a failure. I didn't get that from somebody else, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so to your question, uh, what's something cool I've made? Uh, my latest song, I awesome. guess. Awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. No, I, I definitely, uh, yeah, there is, there's value in other people seeing your work. Um, people will see your work, so um, it's okay to see other people see it. But 
Uh, it's okay to not like things you've made. That's a, a, another sort of subtext of all of this. Yes? Uh, going back into the, can you hear me? Yes. Going back into the world of like people that you follow who yep. you know, do things on the internet that you do. Mm -hmm. You see them doing things at like accelerated rates. Mm -hmm. So as a young person, you look at somebody else who may be your age, who is doing the exact same thing you're mm -hmm. trying to do, but yep. doing it way better than you are. Mm -hmm. I, I, yes, I know, I'm saying yes yeah, because I've yeah. done all these things. What, what <laughs> advice do you have for people who feel like they're so far behind their peers? Uh, so here's what I do when I have that emotion, when I have that, that feeling. Um, first of all, I take a step back, I step out of myself, and I say, how amazing is it that they get to experience those things? Um, so I try and be empathetic in that space. And then, because that doesn't fix my problem of I'm, I feel like a failure, um, I then go and find people who are not successful at anything until they were in their 50s or 60s or 70s, because there are tons of them out there. And I mean, obviously I wrote the whole thing about you want to be a success and that's okay too. And that is true. But also I have to remind myself that like, it could still happen, it's, it's still okay. And success and fame and popularity are not limited resources. There is enough to go around for everybody. More people being successful at a thing you do means more people will like that thing you do when you get to get around to doing it. Cool. And to answer your question, yes. um, I work on a, I have a blog column on a Disney news and entertainment website, up and coming. It's a team of about 45 women, That's awesome. ladies. And I write a blog column that is uh, gaming titles released under Disney's umbrella. Fantastic. Thank you. both uh, Twitch streaming and uh, D&D &D at various points in that. So yes. I have a question about, when you talk about being creative for things that are performative in the context mm -hmm. of like, do you view the, the recording of the Twitch stream or do you view the experience of that, or especially in D&D, &D, which to me feels very creative or is very creative, but often the only product is like the memories and other, and other people's stuff. Like, how do you kind of, especially in the context of D&D &D or Twitch, how do you make the trade-offs between, you know, the moment and only having memories or having, you know, recordings or something visible afterwards? That's a great question. Um, so I think about, uh, ephemeral art in a lot of ways. So again, I mentioned briefly, I have two degrees in theater. Theater is the most ephemeral of arts, but so is playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's the same thing. Anyone tells you otherwise is lying. Um, yes. And there is, there is, there are two audiences when you're streaming yourself playing D&D &D or another role-playing game in the, in the world. Sure. Um, again, I, I did one, I did a, a Fiasco, my favorite RPG podcast, and that's the thing. The audience that matters is the one at the table the audience that doesn't matter is the one watching. Um, so I, I encourage everyone, like if you're doing that, if you want to stream yourself playing D&D, do it, please, it's amazing. Uh, but also, don't worry about the external audience because the best groups out there aren't. Cool, uh, to answer your question, uh, I blog sometimes with a pop culture blog called We've Always Lived in the Kraken, and sometimes I get drafted into their podcasts. Fantastic, thank you. My name is Joy. Nice to meet you. Um, so my question for you is, early on, did you ever not feel joy and obscurity, and how did you switch your mindset? Oh, yeah, I, I felt terrible for a long time. Um, so I did a lot of things in early days, depending on how, how we wanted to find early. So early on in my webcomic and career, I went out and contacted all the webcomic creators and the things I love and said, please look at my thing. And um, a couple of them responded and were like, nice to me about it but not like but like again it's garbage like i put the one with the garbage can on it because it's all garbage um same when i started like started my first podcast i'm like we're gonna be a thing we advertised everywhere we tried to become popular it never happened um i think i had a realization about it though with my first podcast was where i did it when i looked back and said i've been making this for eight years and our audience numbers have been flat that entire time and i said oh like, my life has continued, I've been doing this thing for fun, and then I went back and listened to some of the earliest episodes, and they brought back all of these memories. And that's when I really realized, like, the joy is in the creation of the act, or is the act of creation. Um, audiences are completely secondary and, and unnecessary to that. So that was where my moment was. Okay. Thank you. But, but it took, like, ten years. Like, I took, spent a lot of time being a failure and miserable about it. Yeah. So then, to answer your question, I can say something kind of nerdy and internet-y and gamey, but instead I'll say, I got myself a house and I decorated it myself for Christmas. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. So 
Now, you probably already said that you weren't going to answer these, but I am a curious person who likes to look things. Go ahead. Um, the webcomics and the video game, what are the name of those? Uh, so the webcomic that still exists is called Dude, so it's certainly very searchable. <laughs> um, I don't remember like where it's found though, but I, I, it's probably on like Comic Genesis, very nosy. which is the, like it used to be Keen Space, which was a free web hosting platform for web comics, and I think it turned into Comic Genesis, but I don't remember specifically, but it's called Dude, Dude at my name, you might find it, good luck. After, yeah, after. yeah, it is. It is funny. Was was there a secondary part of that question? Nah, I'm just okay. about yeah. Oh, the games. Oh, the game. Uh, so the game I made, I made it was originally just called Sick. I renamed it Puke Rainbows. <laughs> it's a text-based adventure. Um, it's very short. You can play it under ten, under ten minutes, and it is about a time that I got a norovirus <laughs> and was puking a lot. So it's uh, content warning for vomit. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, again, uh, I think it's technically on itch.io is where I put that. So, if you want to go find it, you can, I won't stop you. Cool. What's um, up the complete name? Um, a decently popular within the fandom video game erotic fanfiction. I love that, thank you so much. How's it going? I'm doing well. Uh, so I kind of have two questions, I'm going to just ask the one. Okay. For the internal creator, how do you stop that internal teardown? Where you're just humbling yourself so much to try to get to reality, but then you just lose yourself in your mind? Yeah, um, so I discovered that uh, when I had to write a master's thesis, uh, which is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Uh, but also, I mentioned I was a playwright involved writing a number of plays as part of that process. Um, and someone, my advisor said to me once, uh, the best version of this thing is the one that is done. <laughs> and I could spend months or years working and refining, and I did it on this. Again, I've been working on this for six months, it doesn't look like it, but I've been, working, I've been changing things up to 10 minutes before we started. Yeah. Um, but when I, I stop critiquing myself when I say I've just got to finish it. And the one that exists is better than the one that doesn't. Uh, a lecture, I teach at uh, awesome. Mac Economics at a community college. That's awesome, thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Um, so I kind of do have two questions. One's really short and easy. What okay. is your cat's name? Felicity. Felicity. She's so cute. Yeah. And she. Then, just, secondary part of it. Uh, if you do subscribe to my newsletter, I'm gonna put the link up in a minute because I. I can't stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, every issue of my newsletter comes with a free picture of Felicity. So uh, there's your reason to subscribe. Don't read it, just look at the pictures. Your, your second question? Uh, second question was, is so you make thing, and people like thing, mm -hmm. and then people start kind of swarming you about thing, and you get overwhelmed by it. Mm -hmm. How do you recommend like kind of dealing with that? Even if it's not a ton of people, it's like say about a hundred people. Yeah. Um, my way of dealing with it is, is turning off notifications on things like Twitter. <laughs> turning off Twitter and Facebook and those sorts of things, like as much as possible, just moving away from it. Um, here's another thing that, this, this is a weird tangential answer to your question. I think somewhere along the line, we forgot that you can pretend not to be you on the internet. <laughs> we spend a lot of time being ourselves on the internet. We have to build a brand, we have to be ourselves in a lot of ways. But you can just make up a new Twitter account and go follow people you like and be anonymous, and you know, call yourself Fred, no one cares. And I think we've forgotten that in a lot of ways. And so when I, when I have any sort of thing like that, I just go be someone else for a little while on the internet. Okay, and then to answer your question, um, I make jewelry, and so I have awesome. a lot of stuff that looks like a pendants, uses a lot of natural crystals and stuff, and it blew up in like a month, and I'm like terrified. I'm sorry you're successful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is kind of an academic question. There's mm -hmm. a thing I've always wanted to know a name for, and you kind of touched on it. Yeah. Um, it is the phenomenon where people project their joys and their successes, not their doubts and their failures. So that's what people see from other people, and they compare their own holistic picture with other people's positive picture and feel doubt and um, despair, or doubt and despair. And I call that the Facebook effect. But I, is there a more, generally used name for it? There might be, thank you, OC5. Uh, there might be, 
I don't know what it is. I'm actually really good friends with uh, uh, someone who studies social media, and she would absolutely be able to tell you what it is, but I don't know. Okay. Uh, but yes, the, it, it's a very real phenomenon. That idea that we only put out the best of ourselves, or that we only see the best of other people, and then compare that to our own bodies. Uh, it's, the Facebook effect is as good thing as anything. Uh, quit Facebook. <laughs> What's something cool you make? And I do a web comic about a software developer who works for a super developer. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. Hi, Leila. Um, so my question is, I'm like 25% successful, I'm extremely lucky, I get to work in animation and I'm an animator. That's awesome. Yeah, doing dope stuff, it's, I got supremely lucky last year, um, but I've struggled with anxiety and depression since I was like a little kid, I'm very used to dealing mm -hmm. with it, but it doesn't make it any less exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I, like I love to try new things and I love to fail at them, I'm really comfortable in that now, but sometimes I get so tired from that creative output all day, every day for my 40 hour a week, that has that risk factor of like, if I don't draw with my monkey hands fast enough, I don't get the money to feed yes. my monkey mouth. Yes. Um, so, uh, is there anything you would recommend for like mitigating those depressive spells when like I come home and I just want to lie down and cover my head with a blanket and drown? Mm -hmm. uh, so I can just like have fun failing and knock myself out of it? Uh, two things that I would recommend. The first one you may be already doing, uh, go to therapy. Um, every, that's true for everyone in this room. Go to therapy. Um, talk to a professional. That's why they exist. Um, you don't have to tell me if you're going to therapy or not. I don't want to out you. Um, the second thing that I do is I try and find a hobby that is almost the opposite of what I'm stressful about. Um, the great example that I learned from a professor of mine, he was a scenic designer, um, and he was also a fisherman. And he's like, I have to just put one away for a while and go do something that does not use any of those muscles or any of those things whatsoever. And it may be something that is non-creative, maybe something destructive, I don't know. Um, I don't know what that would be. Don't hurt people. Um, <laughs> but finding something that is the polar opposite of that allows me to be able to do something without it, uh, it pulling in the fears and the anxieties I have about other, like my creative work. Awesome, thank you. Thank and you. to answer your question, I am making an unabashedly queer and hopeful webcomic about a prince with anxiety. Fantastic, thank you. Hi, my name is Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, I'll interrupt you just for a sec. I do want to hear your question. Um, we don't run out of time, but we're getting close, so if we can make sure we're quick so everybody can get through, and then I can show you two last slides. Okay, so my question is uh, how do you deal with uh, basically you work on something that you put all your heart and soul into it, but it doesn't get the viewership you were expecting. How do you deal with that? Um, it's not an answer that I, I'm happy about necessarily, but I lower my expectations. Um, and that's not easy to do. Um, I would rather be nine people's favorite thing than 100 people's ninth favorite thing. That's a reference to a musical. I'm sorry if you know it. Um, but that's like that's where I put my expectations. I think it would be cool if the people in this room enjoyed this experience. I'm never going to fill up the main theater while the CK is doing their stuff. So I, I lower my expectations and it becomes easier to meet them. And to answer your question is, I'm now working on a wedding video for my friend. Awesome. Thank you. What's the coolest thing you've ever made? Uh, coolest thing I've ever made uh, was a piece of performance art I did in college where I took an armchair and I sat outside the student union building in it for 24 hours wearing Groucho Marx classes, a red beret, carrying a sign that said, this is art on one side and please don't read this sign on the other. <laughs> I think I lost your cat on YouTube. No. Uh, weirdly enough, those two haven't crossed over yet. I've made YouTube videos but not of my cat. No, I mean in like pictures of cutest cats. Oh, that's quite possible. I, I would take a lot of pictures of my cat. <laughs> Coolest thing I've ever done? You'll never see it. It's the stories I've made in my head. Awesome. Thank you. My question, okay, so I work in sports, I'm an apprentice at, so that's probably not my favorite one in here who does. Um, Go sports. My, um, my question is about unpaid internships and like how to combat that. Mm -hmm. um, so basically like it's hard to get these, because I worked in Major League Soccer and now work in mm -hmm. hockey. I want to know like, it's hard because I was driving like three hours a day to get to the stadium and back. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it does take a lot of your time and you're not getting money from it. So what's the best way to get experience that's valuable across the board? Because legally they stand. Yes, so legal they still exist. Um, here is, so I'm, I'm a little bit weird. First of all, don't go on paid internship if you can help it. True. Uh, first and foremost. The only time an unpaid internship is worth it for you, I'm, I'm saying this, you don't have to believe me, is when it is educational, 
not running and getting coffee for people. Um, there is value in learning and, and not, have, not getting paid for learning. And so if, there, if the primary part of it is getting, is valuable to you in that sense, and you can think of it as that way, it's mostly okay. I've got time, so I'm gonna run with it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to end here. I'm so sorry. Um, something cool you've made? Uh, one time I made an embroidered an entire quilt by hand. Cool. Uh, this is where you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kevsond. My uh, newsletter is tinyletter.com slash Kevsond. Shared pain is lessened, shared joy is increased, thus do we refute empathy. Em entropy, I'm tired, it's our day of Thank you, go home.